my mom is a dentist, my dad is a is a, also a dentist and a doctor. Okay. And here I am and I cannot even get accepted into university. Hey everyone, it's Jermaine and welcome to How She Did It Cozy Conversations with T as you can see here. And today we're going to have a no holds barred conversation with someone that I consider an inspiration, a role model and to find out, you know, where she began and how she got here. Everyone say hello to Jessica Ramella. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for joining us. I know you're an incredibly busy professional. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us like give us like a one liner. Who is Jessica? What are you all about? So you guys may know me from The Apprentice. I am actually the winner, you know. I think that that's probably what most people have heard of me from, but I, I've been living in Singapore for seven years. I'm originally born and raised in Venezuela, and I moved to Singapore just to sort of chase more dreams for work, for my career, and I've been always working in sales. I've been sort of just hustling and moving around through life and trying to make the best life that I possibly can for me and my future offsprings. <laughs> right now, because of winning the competition, you are the chief of staff at That's One right. Championship. How is that experience like? It's insane. Like, I mean, there's no day like any other being the chief of staff at One. I Stressful? It's very stressful. Okay. It's very intense. It's very going, going, going. Like, yeah. I feel like at One, there's no one that is, oh, just do this and waits and checks the PowerPoint. Like, everyone's very hands on deck. So yeah. everyone is expect to execute and deliver and be strat strategic. And there's just so much going on all the time. But you learn a lot. You fail fast and pivot. You yeah. know, it's quite a lot of it's a very dynamic place. That's probably what I would call it. You know, during the show, we saw you go through a lot of like trials and tribulations. And I think at some point as well, you were very misunderstood. But one thing that I saw from you was you never lied. That's true. Yes. <laughs> Is that very something true. that you hold, you know, very important to you? Integrity? I do. I feel like, look, without our principles, we're nothing. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I whatever I put it out into the world, I want to be proud of. And my performance in The Apprentice is no difference. Yeah. I just wanted to do my, the best job possible, but at, without compromising, you know, the root of who I am. I never lied. I kept it very real. And coming out of the show, I felt so nervous that maybe I shared too much, that maybe I was too real. And now that it's come out and seeing the feedback that I'm getting from people in terms of how much they can resonate with a lot of the things that I shared, I'm really glad that I actually did. You know, it turns out that always sticking out to yourself mm -hmm. and being your true self is always the right choice, you yeah. know? And people connected with you on that level. They saw the real yeah. you, right? And now stepping into this new role as chief of staff, do you feel like this is the peak of your career? Or do you feel like what? there's more? Uh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm 32. <laughs> <laughs> no, precisely. And you've been at it for so long, right? So what do you think is like next for you? I don't know. I just wanted something. I want to be somewhere that I'm thriving, that I'm happy, that I'm learning, that I'm able to teach. I enjoy teaching and sort of helping others develop themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have a cup of tea here because I need you, you to spill some of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, you know, know about Jessica from the very, very beginning, from mm -hmm. when you were young and you were growing up in Venezuela. And then you kind of left that to go to California all by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. At a very young age. Like you said, you're very independent, but mm -hmm. did you feel like you had to take care of yourself a lot when you were young? Um, I'm an only child and my parents were always very true to me, very honest, very... They saw that I was a bit of like a precocious child. You know, I was very opinionated. I was always like a little bit hungry to like find out what was going on more beyond just like cartoons, for example. Yeah. And I feel like my parents talked to me as if I was also an adult from time to time and told me things how they were. So in that sense, I think I learned, I learned how to have conversations with, with a lot of different walks of life. I never really felt as a child that I had to take care of myself. I feel like that happened much later, like around like my late teens. That's when I started to really feel like, okay, like my, my safety cushion is not there. And then also then when there's a kind of like a rupture in my family nucleus and like my relationship with my dad sort of disappears there, that's when it was like, okay, well, yesterday I could have lost my job and I could have always run to the house of mom and dad. Now I don't have that, yeah. you know? And like that was much later. Um, but growing up in Venezuela, I feel like you have an eye in every side of your head just because you need to make sure that you're, you're, you're protecting yourself, protecting others, that you're not, you know, 
in danger at any time. You, you um, can't take anything for granted. Not like in Singapore, you know? I don't even know like who's behind me half the time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that never happens. Or like leave your phone on the table and yeah. things like that. Like that would never happen. These things make you very sharp, and very alert. And also I think that they make you very street savvy. Yeah. And I think that's also something that I, I can definitely, I, I think I'm very street, street smart. Yeah. Um, not necessarily book smart, but street smart. Like, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> I can navigate pretty well like in, in the outside world. And I feel like I can adapt very easily. So I think that that was a big part of it, like as a, that part in Venezuela. I think another part was the Venezuelan people are an incredibly loving and, and very jovial people. In fact, you would see people that have been queuing there from like four in the morning. They're queuing to buy rice or something like that. And they'll be all in the queue and they'll be playing like dominoes and they'll be playing like cards and they'll have some music and someone will be like, like dancing. You know, this is just like how these people are. Mm. And I think in that regard, that also very much like had an impact on in my life, like that how people are very people driven, like mm-hmm. we are very much about each other. And I think that's very that's very descriptive of, of my personality and, and what I hold most important in my life. What, what made you want to take that leap of faith, right? To move to California and study by yourself and leave all that culture, all that mm-hmm. family back behind in Venezuela? It's complicated because I feel like there was many different aspects, but the main one would be that I always felt like a bit of a fish out of water. I felt like I was a bit weird or a little bit out of place in a way. And and my parents always celebrated this. You know, they were not very luckily. They never tried to like put me back into my box of maybe like going to like the same university that my dad went to or that my mom went to and like, you know, follow like the righteous path of like a good Venezuelan girl. I was like, no, I want to explore, explore the world and I want to find myself and I want to study ab- abroad. And, you know, they, they kind of like encouraged it and allowed me to. So I wanted to learn English. I wanted to study overseas. I wanted to do something more in the arts and I wanted to, you know, study acting and just kind of like see the world. And, you know, I knew that life was more than what I knew at then. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew that it wasn't this. So mm-hmm. I just decided to to take a, a leap of faith and, and jump and go. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, coming out to see the world, and it really expands your horizons and makes you chase more and want more as well. Yeah. It motivates you in a sense, right? Absolutely. But was it difficult for you when you first got to the U.S.? Because you were learning English at this point, and mm-hmm. you were, you know, trying to go to college. College, mm-hmm. they hold classes in English. How did you understand a single thing? Like No, so I spoke I spoke, spoke English, English yeah. but I spoke it like very basic. Like, I mean, I, I spoke enough to pass the test that would allow me to go to college. Oh, OK. But it was like, hello, my name is Jessica. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. You know, it was very, very strong accent. Um, I mean, it, for me, it was more like the culture shock and also being completely alone. Like that was very different. You know, I remember when I went to college, there would be days that would go by that I didn't speak to a single person. And then all of a sudden, like someone would talk to me like three, four days later, my roommate. And I would just be like, hello. Like, I was like, oh, my God. But why was that? So you just felt a bit introverted or I just didn't know anyone. I didn't know how to approach people. I was just in a very new environment and I was very young and I was just I was 18. Yeah. You know, and I was like, how do I make friends? You know, you come from school where everyone is your friend your entire life. And all of a sudden now you're thrown into this environment where I need to make friendships in a different language and like it, it was really difficult. I think also like a, a big break there was starting to find who I really was mm-hmm. versus like the person that my mom built. Now I started questioning like, but why do I dress this way? Mm-hmm. Why am I always straightening my hair? Why am I doing, you know, and it's almost like I went through like a 13 year old puberty again, where I had to like refine and redefine who I was. Mm-hmm. And that was really interesting because I had a lot of like self hate and almost like a bit of anger inside like that insecurities as yeah well. that i didn't understand yeah. why i was doing all these things that actually didn't bring me any joy like rediscovering who you are who jessica is and yeah. kind of building from there right yeah but coming from a family where your mom your mom is a doctor no my your mom, mom is, a, is a, dentist. a dentist and your yeah. dad is a doctor that's right did you feel like any sort of insecurities any sort of like inferiority when it comes to that so much <laughs> really truly um because actually my mom is a dentist. My dad is a is a, also a dentist and a doctor. Okay. And he also went to like physics in university. But like this guy has like three different what? degrees. All my aunts are also in the science, also doctors or wow. dentists. So all of a sudden comes little Jessica and goes like, I want to see the world and I want to be an actress, you know? <laughs> and for them, they were like, but why? You know, like it was yeah. just always like a bit strange. And in fact, my dad made said, okay, you can move to the US and try your luck, but you need to um, apply to medical school as a just in case. 
here in Venezuela. Um, wow. Well, just because he thought that it, I would hate it overseas and I would just come back and just want to to essentially yeah. follow my actual path. Um, he's still waiting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, 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 I got accepted in medical school. I got accepted in nutrition and architecture. Those are my three options. And from there, I just hopped in a plane, I left, and I never went back. Yeah. But um, I did feel for many years that I was failing them, and especially because when you are studying theater or when you are... In the arts. In the arts, yeah. or actually in much later, then I drop the arts, and I'm just trying to like get a degree, and it's impossible for me to do so. I felt like I was just such a failure to them. Like, you know, most... You hear like all these stories of families where no one in the family went to university and I'm the first one to graduate. Mine was the opposite. Like everyone has a degree. Everyone has the master's. Everyone's like Mac on Laude. And here I am and I cannot even get accepted into university. And Did I really you feel like the need to sort of make things seem the reality seem a bit prettier than it actually is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Many times, all of these like little turmoils, I, I kept to myself. But um, with friends, I did glamorize massively because at the time I was just ashamed. Yeah, I was just like I am. I went from like a very good life, a very good family, um, you know, I, a good school. I graduated second of my high school, like all of this stuff, and now I'm like wiping tables and you know working part time and like a bar. You know, it was just like I felt like I had a series of left turns or like wrong turns have taken me into like the wrong destination. And what I, was like the toughest job that you found yourself in where you were like, why, why the hell am I doing this? Mm. Yeah. So one of my first jobs ever was um, in San Diego when I lived in California. It was at a shisha bar. Okay. And that job was horrible. They would make me wear this like little um, skirt with coins so I would just whenever I would walk to like deliver something to the table like you know it would kind of like shake and like all the guys would constantly try to like put tips into my apron oh my gosh. and it was just the the guys um, that I worked with stole my tips all the time so I was never like getting my full cut and no one would believe me because I was just like working under the table yeah. I wasn't supposed to be working you know I was cleaning toilets every night and like these were like the most disgusting things oh like my. it was just you know we had to throw like these buckets of water like in a, like a high pressure high velocity against the wall and the toilet the to like out. get everything oh. out like it was the worst oh my um you know you you do what you gotta do i guess that's the definition of start it from the bottom yeah now you're here yeah you're here. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. but before you got your degree right i mean eventually you did get your degree i did many in, years in later. california no in, no in singapore oh in singapore yeah this is like 10 plus years after. I graduated college and when I graduated college, now I, I had the option to apply for, I guess my next two years of university in San Diego, yeah. but it was gonna cost $100,000 for me to do it. Oh my gosh. I know, and my parents couldn't afford this. And also yeah. studying acting, you know, like, yeah. that doesn't guarantee you a job after. And then, then th that's when I started looking into London or into Europe, because I have a European passport also. So I was like, well, maybe I can move to London that they speak English already. I feel like at this point I already dominated English quite well. And I was like, I can try my luck. You know, it's a quite artsy town, but there's also a lot of foreigners. It's a very young town. I was, you know, it seems up and coming. Let's go. And I just flew to London and I, you know, I've never even been to, to London or anything like that. Do you so have friends there? Or? Nothing. Nada. Nada. The balls <laughs> to do that, you know? <laughs> I mean, I guess like the way that I sold it to myself was if you hate it, you can leave. That's true. So I was just like, I'm just going to try it out and, and see, you know, and yeah. I did a ton of research and I was just like watching videos and just, you know, like everything that I could from a computer screen, I guess. And I just arrived. I went into Craigslist. I found an apartment and I just moved into an apartment with like these two, a, a mom and her daughter uh, from London. OK, OK, because Craigslist, I heard Craigslist and I was like, red flag. Yeah. What if it's a same, murderer? You same. know what? If it's a serial I mean, killer. I have some funny stories about this. Oh, no. Just a mom. The mom and the daughter were not harmless <laughs> no oh i mean God. they were safe but they're a bit crazy um yeah. in a loving way but like the mom had a, had a bit of a drinking problem and she would come into my room at three in the morning crying because she like i don't know something had happened and yeah. then i would just kind of wake up and then she'd be like i can't take off my necklace and i would just like take off her necklace oh and take her to her bed like oh my god and they would have like the biggest fights like the, the daughter was uh 25 or something not a not a kid yeah. um and they would have the biggest fights and they would throw things at each other and i would just literally like get in the middle and be like enough you know like it was just yeah it was a really, really, really interesting Very volatile time. situation. Yeah, massive. It felt very real and yeah. like family because I was like staying with a family. So 
even like helping this woman to lay in her bed and stuff. And like sometimes in the morning she'd be like, oh, hello, and give me a hug. I don't know, like it felt almost like I was living a little bit with family. Um, halfway through, I found out that I was living in a council state and I just didn't know. I didn't know what, what does that mean. A council state is kind of like the government buildings. So like oh. that's where, you know, the government gives grants, like for, free housing yeah. to the, either like people that have disabilities or it could be that they have not they don't have enough money or the mom, the parent cannot work because there's a lot of they have a lot of kids yeah. so essentially I was living in a very dodgy dodgy place and I actually and had no know. idea until like four months or six months in that someone brought me to my house and they're like but you live in a council state and I was just like what do you mean <laughs> ignorance is bliss you yeah know? <laughs> no but I think you made the most up out of your time there so yeah. in London you didn't get a degree as well well so I start applying to university and I'm getting rejected everywhere because they don't really approve of yeah. my qualifications and also they're telling me that I can't pay subsidized fees which was the idea of going to Europe right. because my parents haven't lived for many years in Europe I haven't oh. lived there so I've never paid taxes yeah. so they tell me I need to work for three years and pay taxes for three years before I can um, I can get subsidized schooling. Oh my gosh. If I had heard that, I would have cried. Oh, I cried. <laughs> I cried a lot. Like three years is a long time, yes. you know? And at that time, I think I was already 21 or something. So I start working, I get a job at an ice cream shop, move into the Apple store and yes. you know, like slowly I started doing this. At that time, I also like took A levels, cause which is kind of like the British qualification yeah. so I could get accepted easier. I finished my three years, I then, apply and they tell me okay but now you're something that is called a mature student and a mature student no i know what a pain in the ass honestly no every step was an obstacle so a mature student needs to have a cv that can demonstrate why they haven't essentially studied for the past six years since because you said <laughs> yeah but <laughs> they don't care oh, they man. don't care so they're like your cv doesn't represent the career that you want to study yeah. so like this is just not going to work out it and keeps knocking you down exactly like, at this point. exactly so i kept working for like a year and a half more thinking that that year and a half i could add into my cv yeah. and then finally at, the, at some point then they raised the fee from 2000 pounds to 12,000 pounds a year so at this point if i got accepted in university i would be like 36,000 oh pounds in debt by the time that I was like 28. And I was like, I can't. And I think that was for me like the straw that broke the camel's back. I was like, okay, you know what? Studying is just not for me. Like I I tried, I generally gave it a good shot and I'm just never gonna go to university. Like it's just not in the cards and I just need to focus on, on building my career. And I kept working and I kept moving forward. And it wasn't until I got here to Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I'm not gonna do anything with my weekends, I might as well get something out of them. So I was like, well, maybe I can do like a course or something. And maybe I'll meet some people in the course, you know, like yeah. I, I, don't, I didn't know how to meet people. And when I did, uh, I started looking, I realized that there was this part time degree by the University of Adelaide mm. and I applied. And for some miracle, I got accepted. So when I moved here to Singapore, I, I worked full time and I also went to university Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And I stayed in the office until like 11 p.m. doing homework pretty much every day. But then after like two years, I graduated. Finally, I grabbed the beautiful bachelor's degree. I put it in a drawer and I continue working <laughs> because at that time I was making more money than most of my friends yeah. anyway. Like I was already a, a, a full blown professional, but. Like you needed to do I it for yourself it. just to have that piece of paper. It's so expensive. Yeah. Just to prove to yourself that you never gave up, you know? I think so. Yeah. And I think it was also like an ego thing. It was like my. You know, it, something that would drive me insane was the thought that the kids that were copying my homework and copying my tests yeah. to graduate high school now are like engineers. And I yeah. couldn't even get accepted into university. I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, this is the, the, the upside down world. You know, like uh, the, it makes no sense. And I just couldn't understand that there's people out there just like, you know, parting their way through university. Yeah. And I genuinely wanted to study. I genuinely wanted to get accepted and like get the most out of this thing. And I just couldn't do it. Like mm -hmm. it just felt like a sick game <laughs> um so yeah i think it was a little bit of ego a little bit of proving it to myself and also like i don't know probably something that would have bothered me for the rest of my life if i never got it done but it's something that fuels you as well and i think we saw that through the competition like it's something it's like a fire that's deep inside because you're not going to get through months of no sleep you know physical and mental kind of endurance and stuff like that without having something so strong yeah. pushing you on the inside and I understand that you also do not have such a good relationship with your father. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you are comfortable to talk yeah, about yeah, with us? Of course. Yeah. yeah. So how did that you think affect? Because in the competition we saw, you're obviously a very genuine person, but you have your walls up. Mm -hmm. Do you think that stemmed from this? 
I think so. I mean, I think the relationship with my dad was a, uh, it was really good growing up until maybe when I turned around 13 and that's when everything started like going down. And then he was very strict and he was really tough with his words. And my dad was never one to like scream or like curse or anything like that. He would just tell you things like, I am just so deeply disappointed in you. You know, like this very yeah. like cutting. Very um, harsh words. Very yeah. harsh words. And to him, I was always never like good enough. And then as we know my journey of university, it was almost like, you know, I kept failing, essentially. I was just like this young, mature girl that didn't know what she was doing. And, you know, he was like, well, you're obviously like you've wasted your time, you know, and it was always this feeling of, of I always felt judged like I was ruining my life, you know, and, and that he, he just couldn't understand where I was coming from or what I had done, what I had done, but also was not willing to like give me better options. You mm -hmm. know, it was like you need to go figure it out and then that's it. And I think that that developed almost a feeling of like never being good enough. And I think also that's where the guard comes from, right? Because like a part of me, the, the imposter syndrome in me doesn't want to show you the failure that I actually am. And then the other part of me is like, well, I'm not going to allow other people to come close that are going to hurt me or say things like this to me. You know, obviously in my mind, rationally, I understand that the two things that I just said are false. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, I know that I'm not a failure. I know that I um, that my imposter syndrome is not real like, and, and it's very normal for people to have it. But I think that that's where the wall kind of builds itself for a bit. And do you feel like all the more you want to prove to him that you are of substance, that you have succeeded, you know, is that something that drives you as well? I don't know anymore. I feel like I, in the probably in the beginning, yes. Mm -hmm. Now I, I really truly do it for myself and I try to not do it for him anymore. Mm. And like, I'm not going to give that gift to, to him. You know what I mean? Um, I do feel that what's happened and also the way that he raised me has made me incredibly resilient and very um, tough and also very hardworking. Um, I'm sure like he had an impact, but today I just do it for myself to like grow myself, to be better myself and also to provide a better future for myself, for my mom, for my family, for, you know, for the things that matter to me other than those that are not in my life anymore. You know, when was the last time that you spoke to him? I think it was probably like seven or eight years ago. Yeah. My dad and I had a disagreement. Super stupid. <laughs> Nothing major over text. And the one of the last phrases was something like, well, you'll understand when you grow up. And I was, I don't know, like 24 or something like that. He's like, you'll understand when you grow up um, or when you're a parent. And I said to him, you know, you've been saying this to me my entire life, but the older I get, the least I understand of, of the way that you act with me. And he sent me a thumbs up, and that was the last time that we ever talked. Sometimes I think that we we glorify parents when we're young, you know, because that's all we have. But we Massively. grow up and we realize that they are flawed too. They're yeah. humans too. And they had their own trauma mm -hmm. growing up that, unfortunately, I, I can see like some of it is being put onto you. Mm -hmm. And that probably made your mom all that more important in your life mm -hmm. ever since, you know, you guys kind of stopped Absolutely. being in contact. So in the last seven or eight years, like how has that relationship with your mom improved or changed? Um, I feel my mom, my mom was my best friend growing up. I mean, I have no okay. siblings, right? Yeah. So I was always with her all the time. And my mom is like the sweetest, most loving person. And also she's very, um, I feel like she lives her life for others almost. So like for her to give to me was essentially her life's purpose. Um, I feel like at some point, like whenever I turned like 14, 15, our roles started almost like shape changing a little bit okay. from like mother daughter to almost like friends. And now we joke that I am the mom, you know, like uh, I'm like, mom, enough, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like I'm always telling her off. But um, I think like my mom relied very heavily on me growing up because she had so much trouble at home yeah. with dad. And I would remember being like 14, 15, like counseling my mom, yeah. you know, being like, leave him. You know, like uh, you're not happy like this. Not, this is not normal, you know, and I think a lot of the love for self growth and wellness and sort of, you know, that I've put on myself comes also from like at very young age, having to have these really heavy conversations that you're not prepared to have as a teen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you're the parent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to take on you feel the pressure of this responsibility. Massively. Right? So, I mean, coming up from that and, you know, seeing the how your mom is in your life now, like do you wish that you guys were staying together now? Like, do you want to move back home? You know, it's it's a really tough co conversation. Actually, my mom and I are constantly talking about this, figuring out like when is the time that we're ever going to reunite? 
I do wish that we were in the same country, of course, um, not living together exactly mm -hmm. in the same house. Yeah. Because, like, you know. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a certain extent. Yeah. yeah, you love them, but there's exactly. a limit. Yeah. But I do feel that we, I would love for us to live in, in the same country. I would love to, like, buy her the apartment next door to me, you know, or, like, yeah. uh, something that we're very close by. We can see each other all the time, but that she can have her space and I can have mine. I don't know where that's going to be. I don't know if it'll be Europe. I don't know if I'll be able to ever like bring her here for like a prolonged period. Mm -hmm. But right now it feels like it's really not in the cards anytime soon. So we're just making do with whatever we can and, and seeing each other as much as we can. Although COVID has not helped, yeah. you know. But do you FaceTime her at least? All the time. Yes. Yeah, of course. I love yeah. that. I love that you guys are so close and yeah. you have that relationship. Yeah. So what's one of like your favorite memories with your mom? My mom and I like have like the silliest games all the time. And a lot of times we just had to kill some time. I don't know, waiting for my dad to do something. But we would just sit and like we would just people watch. And when we people watch, we play all these games of like almost like <laughs> um, throw or keep, you know. Okay. So like depending on whatever they were wearing or whatever we were doing, you know, we'd be like throw, throw, <laughs> keep, keep, throw, things like that. And it was just being silly and like just making... I guess like killing time together and just like bonding together. I think my yeah. my mom, I don't know why, but she like finds me to be so funny and like she laughs all the time. And I think I love making my mom laugh. Yeah. So like a lot of time this game of just kind of like seeing people walking by and just like, you know, saying throw, keep, whatever. And like, I would just say why. I'd be like, ooh, that'd be a great husband. You know, and this, imagine like a 11 year old being like, that's a great <laughs> husband. My mom was like, what the hell? Like, you know, but I was this type of kid, you know, I was really like a, opinionated and yeah, sassy and like yeah. a little bit actually i'm i'm so curious to see like a photo of your mom because seeing how you look she must be drop dead gorgeous so thank you <laughs> do you have a thank picture you. of her with it i have you another picture for you which yeah. is kind of like it sums up the relationship of my mom and i okay like to a t yeah so this is just to give you a bit of context this is a birthday party and we are playing at the piñata okay, okay yeah, yeah, yeah so we're hitting the piñata and then all the kids took all the candy or the candies that i wanted i guess yeah. and then this is where this picture gets captured so <laughs> <laughs> essentially my mom is super peaceful yeah. calm listening to me and i am going ballistic shouting angry because, yeah, everyone took the candy. Yeah, and I have like the bag with like the stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> but like this is essentially my mom and I to a team. My mom is just so calm and so like calm and collected and sweet and just Jesse, just calm down. And I am just like this <laughs> firecracker, just like going crazy. Um, but yeah, this is one of my favorite pictures of me and my mom because I really feel like this is our relationship. To a T. She's almost like smiling, you know? She's yeah. like, oh, Jessica's so cute, you know? Yeah. And I am literally about to go kill another child. You guys have such a unique relationship. Is there anything that you would want to tell her now? I mean, I tell my mom that I love her and that I, yeah. you know, that if I become half of the woman that she is, like, I've, I've done a good job, you know? So, like, there's not much that is there left for me to say, but, like, I, I think it's never uh, too late to, to tell the people that you love, that you admire them, that you're proud to be their daughter in my case. And, you know, I, I continue to strive every day to, like, make her proud and to ensure that she feels safe and protected, especially when she hasn't been feeling safe and protected for, for many years now. So I guess it's my, my journey to, like, empower her, make sure that she feels like she is amazing like how she is and that yeah. she knows that you can do whatever you want now this is your time to go have fun don't worry that i got it you know like so go try go explore like you were a housewife for so many years and this husband though super strict with you like go explore go live your life go be fun and i got it you know mm -hmm. like now i am the safety the the safety cushion you know you can fail all you freaking want until the day you die and then you can always just come, you know that you have a home, you have a base, you know that I'm okay, you're going to be okay, I have money, like, you know, I'll, I got you. <laughs> and that's, that's something that, like, even during times when you go through imposter syndrome, which, like you said, is very common mm -hmm. in a very high competitive environment, it's natural to feel that way, right? Yeah. But you have this side of you that's super confident. So I wanted to know from you, what does success even mean to someone like that? I feel like, I mean, success is a really personal thing, right? Like uh, success is not only money or career. Maybe for some people it is changing and it's accepting all of those different stages of my life with grace. I, I think it's also potentially for me, and it's not for everyone, but for me, I think I would like to have a family. There's so many different like areas that I feel like are success. And, you know, I also be a fool to know that not all of them will happen, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that also has to be okay. I think like success is probably also 
sitting back and no matter what the journey was, being okay with it. Being so, proud of yourself yeah. and how far you've gotten, right? Like Exactly. E- let's say, I mean, obviously you won the competition, then that's great, like, thank goodness, right? But mm-hmm. even if you didn't win, would you have considered yourself a success? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I, the, the competition is an incredible uh token and like a validation but like the competition doesn't define me right so like uh, and I mean I would have never been able to go or be accepted in the competition if I wasn't already like delivering at a certain level yeah um but also when the competition got me they had no idea who I was really as a person it was only in a career sort of setting right yeah. so it's it's also really wonderful to, to to see how those parts of myself my true colors like the person that I am was also a huge reason why I was able to win the competition. I just need to know, like watching you through the competition, like knowing so much about your life now, on your darkest days, right? It must not be easy. What what keeps you going or what brings you back and centers yourself? The thing that keeps me going, it's the internal true belief that I got it. As in, or as that in, I got my back, you know? Yeah. That I, I know no matter what, I will show up for myself and I will keep going to, 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 to to get out of whatever situation I'm in. So I think even when I feel lost and I don't know what I'm gonna do next or I'm unhappy or I feel like maybe I made a mistake or you know I feel misunderstood, whatever it may be, I know like I got Jessica, you know, like uh, and the Jessica's got my back in, in a way. And I feel like that gives me an incredible sense of inner peace and reassurance to actually then dare to do whatever I need to do or to keep just showing up. So on the competition, it was very tough for you, I think there were probably times where you would have cried as well oh my god so much crying really (laughs) i cried so much like i would have like little like power cries in the bathroom and just hide and just like because i didn't want anyone to to know that i was like suffering or like feeling sad but also i really like as many nights i cried myself to sleep you know i in the show itself and and i don't want to spoil it for anyone but i i have a lot of conflict with some of the other members and I find out that some of the members of, of my team are essentially like come plotting to get me kicked out and that made me feel really vulnerable and that made me feel really sad like I was I guess like we all like to be liked um, and knowing that people are ganging against you like you feel vulnerable and a lot of times I just had to like wake up in the morning like look at myself in the mirror and be like remember your why like remember why you're here and like let them look at you and you look at the finish line Mm. in fact like if they need a distraction and you need to be the distraction let them get distracted you know like it doesn't matter focus on you and it would have been so easy for me to be equally as petty yes and it would have back oh and and it would have felt so much better because you know taking the high road is not very pleasant you know and I, I kept saying, you know, when they go low, you go high. When they go low, you go high, you know. And I was just really trying to stay true to myself. You're not going to do anything that you regret. And you're not going to do anything that you regret because of them. You mm. know, like, no, ma'am. Like, uh, th- this is not going to happen here today. You know, you don't have that power or influence on me. And at the end, of the, I, I would just also sometimes think, who am I getting this criticism for from? And do I admire them? So like, you know, a lot of the times we give so much value and power to people that if we were outside of this this completely interaction, would you want that opinion or, or do, do you respect that individual? No. I'm so proud of the way that you presented yourself. You Thank came you. back every day, level-headed, objective, and you never showed that that side of you. Because if they're painting you out to be a bad person, you don't want to prove them right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, actually, I'm very proud of myself, too, in that sense, because yeah. in the morning I would wake up and I would just show up and be like, hi, good morning, everyone. You know, like, I would always be civil. I always answer questions. You know, if we close the, the room where we had all our stuff, I would pack on the regular their bag if there would be a, like interviews or something i would be the one packing their stuff in there so it wouldn't get locked out and they wouldn't lose it you know like and now and they wouldn't do the same for me and my things got locked down many times they ordered dinner they didn't even order dinner for me you know like it triggered a bunch of like high school bully stuff from from back in the day but i was like this is not me like this is just so petty and nasty and and not at my level, like, I'm sorry. And I would just pack everything and take it. Like, I don't need to sabotage them to win or the competition. Yeah. Like, they're going to be their own demise. And then that was it. So, like, I just, I kept that mindset constantly throughout the competition because I just, I knew that it would, 
it would be a very easy distraction. Mm. Yeah, but right. that's why the victory is so sweet. Yes. Yes, like this tea that we're having. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Ramella, thank you so much for being with <laughs> us here so on the very first episode of our Appreciate show. Thank I you can't so much wait for to see all me. that you achieve, truly, truly. So thank you so much for watching this episode of How She Did It. If you love what you saw, make sure you hit like, share, and follow. And let us know in the comments below your thoughts because we'd love to hear them. See you next episode. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.